Do a video to Tuborovsky. So to start off with, it's been brought to my attention that I am often articulating my message too quickly for those whose native language is not English and to try to slow it down just a little bit. So I'll try. Can't promise anything. Uh, sometimes when I am giving my message here, I get enthused and uh, that's all I can do to stay in my chair. So if you fall asleep and fall out of yours, uh, there's no one to blame for that but you. So I will try to reduce the speed here and take it that much more deliberately. So it's Memorial Day here in the USNA, a day dedicated to the deeds of the nation's war heroes. So what better way to do that than look at the bloody mayhem of the 20th century? In that regard, a book by Yale history professor Timothy Snyder has been given a lot of predictable hype lately. This is Bloodlands between Hitler and Stalin, Professor Snyder's recounting of the genocide, real and alleged, occurring in the borderlands between Hitler's Germany and Stalin's Russia, hence Professor Snyder's play on words for his title. I say predictable because it's a twice-told tale, not only in the familiar subject matter, but in the assumptions behind it, that the crimes against humanity practiced in this region of Europe are the products of the totalitarian ideologies of the states committing them. Further proof of the evils of political extremism and deeds the democracies could never be capable of. This is a rehash of one of the more persistent myths in Western political discourse, that the democracies offer a sensible center between the extremes of left and right. Whole libraries already exist cataloging the horrors of fascism and communism, how Western democracy was obliged to oppose these evil systems by its values and, if necessary, gear up for direct battle against them. How and why the rave reviewers of Professor Snyder's book can think he's plowing new ground here is beyond me, but that's not the purpose of this kind of history, which is to give the Western powers a backhanded round of applause for themselves. Never mind that history, Professor Snyder's supposed specialty, will not bear out this cardinal assumption. Why not? Well, I'm going to launch into a little history rant here, so if this isn't your thing, I suggest you switch to a funny cat video channel for a little while. For those of you still remaining out there, here's the first reason why Professor Snyder's assumption is misplaced. The so-called bloodlands of which he writes, specifically Poland and Ukraine, have always been frontier zones of empire where blood was freely spilled into the earth, long before Herr Professor's convenient ideological parameters. As an undeveloped zone of preliterate, pre-industrial peasants, it was Europe's third world at home, its people always colonized and brutalized as natives by foreign conquerors while not waging tribal wars of extermination against each other. For instance, neither Hitler nor Stalin can take credit for the mass murder of Poles and Jews by Ukrainian nationalists, nor for the kills of pogrom in Poland in 1946. Both of the political extremes which fought it out here in World War II were outgrowths of World War I, which was started by neither fascists nor communists. Before the war, said movements existed only in embryo, and could come to power only because of the militarization of society common to all the belligerent powers. Yes, you say, but so what? Wasn't war mobilization by the Western democracies, and we'll include here Tsarist Russia, of course, like we include Saudi Arabia now, only a temporary expedient? But, you know, two problems. First, the social costs of militarizing society are usually greatly underappreciated by those pushing it. Rather than strengthen a society through unity, such pressure can, instead, expose its fractures and fault lines and split them as wide open as the devil in church. Secondly, Europe of the time was not nearly so democratic as we like to pretend. This applies not only to Imperial Germany as the precursor of fascism, or Tsarist Russia as the godfather of Bolshevism, but to all the European belligerents, including France, Britain, Austria, Italy, the so-called good guys of modern NATO. Social, economic, and national alliance were still as bitterly drawn as any race-based system in the Mississippi Delta, without any special radical ideology being necessary. The war was launched in good part to mobilize the masses away from the dangers of creeping democracy and socialism, rallying them against a common enemy and around their fatherland, their patri and king or czar or kaiser. It's thus no surprise that, embedded in the larger war itself, was a covert civil war. Only a few radical, reckless souls like Lenin sought to draw this out, turn the imperialist war into a civil war, he said. And in the context of a war-shattered Russia, he was able to do just that. 
easily brushing aside the democratic posers of the Russian provisional government. Because a middle-class democratic capitalism or a social democracy were equally unlikely in the Russia of this period, because the demographic basis for either was too narrow. The property and working classes together were no more than 30%, the rest being composed of preliterate, pre-industrial peasants, again Europe's third world. A true democracy would have to allow for that, just as a true democracy in the Mississippi Delta would have to allow for its majority to adapt its political and economic models to this social reality. The middle-class democratic reformers of Russia were unwilling to make those kind of political or economic concessions and wouldn't even hold the free election they supposedly stood for because the dark people, their very own term, would gain too much undeserved influence. No wonder they were swept from power and were consistently overthrown by their own right-wing military allies in the so-called white areas they temporarily controlled. And though the Bolsheviks under Lenin and Stalin would also brush aside workers' democracy in the Soviets and would also in time stomp the peasantry like, well, like peasants, like third world ants, they originally prevailed precisely because under their new ruling system, private property was irrelevant. They had none to defend, so let the ants seize and farm their own little mounds for a while. But, to be fair, Russia's poor village masses could not govern Russia economically or politically. That could only come from the cities. And given the social gap between Russia's first and third worlds, it's no wonder that the second world model of industrial socialism prevailed over Western-style financial and commercial capital. When this same scenario began playing out a year later in defeated Germany, the conservative forces were too strong, resulting in counter-revolution, in strangling both a socialist and democratic revolution, preserving the very classes and persons who would, in time, assist Hitler to brush aside the fragile and compromised Weimar Republic. So, it was the warmongering of the great powers themselves that created the conditions for fascism and Bolshevism. And while quick to brand these offspring as bastards like most deadbeat dads, they're just as quick to deny paternity, even in the face of a DNA test. But that raises the whole question of what exactly constitutes legitimacy. It's a legal term, and usually a convenient legal fiction, created to, created to channel inheritance in certain directions. But if all life is legitimate in itself, and you've created it by your own action, then by all laws of nature it is your offspring, and you thereby have the duty to deal with it in a lawful manner, not by denial, nor trying to kill your offspring before someone catches on to the resemblance and you're stuck with paternity claims. So, continuing to look at this region in World War I, we see the same inherent congenital patterns of ethnic cleansing and content for humanity that would mark it during the second. Jews were pushed out of this area by czarist armies for being too pro-German at this time, or so it was thought. Whole populations were expelled from the battlefronts by the millions and deported into the interior. The immediate precursor of the Gulag were the prisoner of war camps scattered all over Siberia, whose inmates were hired out as forced labor to civilians. No totalitarian ideologies were needed for this. Nor for Turkey's ethnic cleansing and attempted genocide of Armenians from Anatolia in 1915. Nor for Germany's rape of Louvain in Belgium the year before. What made that shocking and memorable was that the said uh, atrocity there was perped not in the Congo, not in the Ukraine, not upon peasants or Jews or other backward eastern peoples of the bloodlands, but on euros of impeccable first world credentials. But look, as though the democracies did win World War I, so what's the point of this drawn out history lesson? Well, what did they win? Did they really make the world safe for democracy? What's the practical difference between that slogan and Lenin and Trotsky fighting to promote world revolution? We've been sold the Western party line for a century, and instead of applying our critical facilities to our own accounts, we keep paying on this bill all this while and are still waiting for the goods. The point is that World War I just made the world less safe for World War II to emerge out of it. No question of legitimacy or paternity there. And for the little hot wars of the Cold War after that. And the there was nothing in the West's operative concept of democracy to prevent militarizing society, conquering and maltreating subject peoples, squashing democracy and human rights when it was in uh, its own self-interest to do so. And it was on that basis that Bolshevism and Nazism emerged from the defeated powers. These same currents of revolution and counter-revolution also existed in the Entente powers. And I have no trouble believing that had they lost in 1918, Said currents would have ripped apart the UK, France, Japan, and all the other victorious belligerents. There would be no room for gloating about the so-called sensible center protecting democracy because Western democracy has never protected anyone from its own greed and violence. It did not do so a century ago, 
and shows no signs of sparing the planet and its people in the future. In the bloodlands of Indochina, three times as many people died from the bombs and napalm of democratic France and America than by the hands-on Khmer Rouge, but one would never know this precisely because of the kind of self-congratulating history dominating the academic establishments of those victorious powers of World War I. Uh-oh. I can knock on my YouTube line. Don't need to be wired to take this call. Hello? General Patton! And how are you celebrating this Memorial Day? Kicking Hitler's ass all over the backside of hell, eh? You know you never get tired of that, do you? You just called a letter of viewers uh, know you're still pissed at him for giving war a bad name in the Western world? Ah, don't worry. Thanks to NATO, these fine Western traditions and values march onward into the new millennium. As you well know, General, war crime tribunals are just for losers.